morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here today for the first um, international symposium on science of education. I'd like to thank Roberto and all the organizing committee for having me here. Um, I am a brain scientist interested in how we can augment, enhance brain plasticity, that is, stretch the limits of your learning. And in this context, um, it's in this context that I've been interested in technology, and not any kind of technology, actually, I'm already going to tell you mostly about uh, video games. I'm actually quite thankful to the NSF for being supported by a cyber learning grant. Um, and I'm also uh, in a very interested experiment with the World Economic Forum, being one of their experts on how we can use technology to actually rethink education worldwide. It's a big topic, there are many challenges laying ahead, but there is one clear message is that we need all the partners, all the disciplines around the table will go much faster if we do so. And so congratulations on setting up such an interdisciplinary center. So in my research, and um, it's going to be somewhat of a surprise to you, I'm looking at a very specific kind of video game. And um, this is the kind of video game that I'm looking at, if you can get rolling. So this is not the first kind of video game you would think of as an educational video game, right? Most of you, when you come back home and see your 13-year-old playing this kind of fast-paced, action-packed, chase zombie or whatever bad guys around there, are first thinking, oh, come on, can't you do something more useful with your time than playing this, like, mind-dubbing video games? It happens that our lab and a number of other labs over the past 15 years have um, discovered that these video games can actually have positive impact on a number of different aspects of behavior. And so the first thing I want to show you is how we proceed in the lab so that you understand how we establish those effects. So we have a whole line of research looking at vision. It was not a given that playing video games would improve your vision. If anything, you have lots of report in the media saying that too much time on screen is actually bad for vision. And that's actually true, but it depends what you do on the screen. Actually, it's bad for vision mostly if you are like us, academics, and you do a lot of reading. Um, in the case of people playing action video games, what we did is to measure their vision, very basic skills. So how well can you resolve very small letters like you have on a prescription um, bills, or how well you can see when there is a lot of fog, for example, when you're driving in fog. So we measure those kinds of visual skills. We don't measure them by having people driving around in fog. That would be a little costly. But we measure them in the lab. And I'm going to show you this one task to give you a feel of the kind of task we use in the lab. People come to our lab, they sit in front of a computer screen, and they are asked to do the thrilling task of fixating. Then they know they're going to be presented with two frames. Of these two frames are marked by um, these crosses, and they have to tell us in which frame the Gabor patch is presented. So a Gabor patch is the best friend of vision scientists, and if you have good vision, you may see there's a little guy here that's a Gabor patch. Now, you do that for about two hours on the hand, and that's how we measure your contrast sensitivity at all different kinds of spatial frequency, and we can really describe how good your vision is. And I'm showing that to you because I hope you can sense it's slightly different from playing an action video game. It's not as enthralling. It's actually deadly boring. You're just pressing a key first second for an hour and a half. Doing that, we can show that people that report playing action-packed video game for five hours or more every week for the last six months have better contrast sensitivity, meaning they can actually resolve smaller difference in shades of gray, and so, or they could see the dog crossing um, when they're driving in the fog better than people that don't play those games. But one of the issue, and really the core issue, is that if we want to translate this research to either education or rehabilitation of patients, we need to show that we can take any of one of you here, force you to play those games, and show that there are improvement in vision. And so that's what we do. We do training studies where we get subjects to come into the lab and we first, for example, measure how good their vision is. 
Then we randomly assign them to one of two groups, one group which is forced to play action-packed video game. The other group is also forced to play video games, but video games that have different features. They're also commercially available video games, video games people get very attached to, they have people crying where their Sims character die, but it's very different game mechanics and we can talk about that during the questions. And what we do is we ask these people to play. Now, we don't ask these people to play for 20 minutes. We don't ask these people to play for an hour. We ask these people to play like for 30 hours or 50 hours. It's hard to change your brain. It's really hard to actually improve your vision. And we don't ask for 50 hours in a week. We ask for 50 hours over a period of 10 weeks, one hour per day, five days a week for a period of about 10 weeks. And this is called distributed practice. You probably know that in schools. There is this notion that doing a little bit of the same thing over and over again gives you a leverage for learning. And that's actually true also in the case of action video game. So the question we ask is, at the end of the training, when people, come back, whoops, when people come back a few days later, how are they going to perform? And the prediction is that if action video games have an edge and lead to greater learning, we expect those individuals in the action trained to show greater improvement between pre and post than those that have played social games. So here are the data. The higher the bar here, the more improvement, so the greater the improvement between pre-test to post-test. And you can see that those individuals trained in action video game improved more than those trained in the control group. This was just a few days after the end of their training. In this experiment, we wanted to know whether the changes were stable, whether they were durable. This is also important whether you want to apply this work to education or rehabilitation to make sure that the changes are here to stay. That's what we need in education, that's what we need in rehabilitation. So we had people come back five months after and some more than a year after. And what you can say, there's still some effect, despite the fact that those people have stopped playing. They only played their 50 hours, and then after that, they actually returned to their normal life and didn't pick up gaming. So this is one example in the field of vision. But what caught our interest is that there are other examples in other fields. So a totally different skill, mental rotation, you heard a little bit about it through the talk of David, um, has also been explored in action video games. Now the kind of skill that um, is tested here is um, tasks like this one, where you're presented with a shape as a subject. Now you need to pay attention because I'm going to get you to do the task, so open your eyes and get your brains to function. Your task is going to tell me which of the four shapes I'm going to present to you here is a rotated version of that one shape. Say one, two, three, or four. So is it one, is it two, is it three, or is it four that if you rotate this shape, you will get one of these shapes? Who votes for one? Who votes for two? You guys are not voting, you're not using your brains. Oh, some people vote for three. Who votes for three? Yeah, great. Those people have double dose of coffee. Like They are going to be super efficient all day long. Um, and so this is the kind of tasks that are actually being used in the lab to uh, test the mental rotation skills of those individuals. The experiment I'm showing you is actually an experiment from colleagues at the University of Toronto, where they got participants to come and they tested their mental rotation skills, as I showed you. Then they randomly assigned them to one of two groups. One of the group forced to play an action video game, another group forced to play another type of game. It's a visual motor game, that's a control game. This was a 10-hour training study. Again, it's not 10 hours in a day. It's 10 hours over a period of two weeks, small distributed practice. And then after a few days, they tested again on a different test <coughs> the mental rotation skills of the participants. And as you can see, the data are very similar to what I showed you before. For those individuals that are trained on the action video game, you have an improvement from pre to post. A few days later, but also five months later, it's still there, despite the fact that people have stopped playing. For those people that have been trained on the control game, there's no change in performance. 
So these are just a few examples, and there's actually a number of other domains that are changed by playing those games. Um, we are in the process of doing a meta-analysis, and what we're looking at is what are the different kind of perceptual, attentional, cognitive domain that are changed by playing those games. Those games have a sizable effect overall. In training study, you have an effect size of 0.4. The important thing to realize is that um, for those of you that are not in the business, if you step into a school and you compare an intervention to doing business as usual, you also get a 0.4 effect. So a 0.4 effect in itself is actually not something to boast about. But what's really interesting is this is a 0.4 effect above and beyond using active control. That is, other video games that have all the bells and whistles, people are engaged, they're motivated, they dream about it, they're really entertained by them. And that's actually something which is hard to see in the literature on learning, to find interventions where you get such kind of broad transfer uh, that is so resilient. And actually, I can tell you the other domains that are out there under scrutiny are music training. You heard a little bit about it yesterday. And um, every kind of different technique that have to do with meditation. So different kind of um, meditation techniques that also seem to have a broad impact of this kind. In our case, what we could show is that these video games have a positive impact on different aspects of performance, how well you see or you hear, um, different aspects of attention, how well you pay attention, like when you want to focus your attention, um, task switching and multitasking, which is something which is very high-level cognitive and requires control, and spatial cognition. There were no effect in other domains such as um, automatic attention, verbal cognition, problem solving, or inhibition. And there's more to follow. Obviously, we need more studies, but this is just to tell you that despite the fact that transfer is broad compared to what we see typically in the learning literature, not everything is going to be changed. Not everything is going to be probably changed for the better. There may be also things to change for worse, and that's also one of our interests in our lab to actually study that. But for now, what I want to turn to is the fact that such broad transfer is relatively surprising, and we, are, we really want to understand the mechanism. Where is it coming from? And so what I'm going to argue is something you heard already yesterday about music training and some of the talks before about bilingualism, that the core mechanism is really a change in attentional control. Now, in the case of video games, it's not a given, right? You probably not, there's not a week without some form of media reporting that playing video games is dumbing down our kids and turning them in ADD, ADHD children. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but it's almost the, um, the print out there. In our case, for those kind of action video games, we actually did test, um, put that, that to the test. And so we had participants come to the lab and um, do an experiment uh, which is very often used in clinics to um, assess ADHD children. It's a very simple computer-based task. As a subject, you sit in front of a computer screen and you're presented with a square. The square can appear at the top, whoops, sorry. The square can appear at the top or at the bottom. If the square appears at the top of the screen, you need to go. It's a go task and you need to press a big button that is in front of you. If the square appears at the bottom, you need to withhold your response. So there is one condition which is called the impulsivity condition, and it will be very transparent to all of you why, is that because most, most of the time you need to go, and then from time to time you need to withhold your response. You really need to inhibit this kind of automatic um, push of that big button. In the other condition, it's a sustained attention condition, it's the opposite. Most of the time, the square is at the bottom, there's absolutely nothing to do. It's dreadfully boring. You're beginning to mind wander. Like, you know, it's a little bit like being in a lecture hall all day long. Um, and from time to time, you know, the teacher is saying, you, here, what did I just say? And like, you are, like, need to recollect your, your, yourself and then respond here. Um, and that's a measure of how well you can sustain your attention while nothing is happening. So we all know for uh, most research that your reaction time here are going to be longer than when you are in this target frequent condition. And this is certainly something that we see here. You see here the reaction time of subjects as a function of whether they were action gamers or not. 
Um, you can see that when the target is infrequent, the reaction time are longer than when the target is frequent. But what's really stunning too is the fact that those people that report playing action video games are much, much faster. So you could say, look, Daphne, we know that. Have you seen those kids? They're so trigger happy that, of course, they're going to like want to go. But what's interesting is that in those studies, we also get percent correct. And they are really fast, but they don't make more errors. So they're certainly not more impulsive, and certainly don't have more sustained attention. In fact, if you think about it, this seems to make more correct response per unit of time, which is something that is actually useful. I'm sorry, this is in French. I'm giving talks in so many different languages that I didn't even notice. <laughs> um, this has actually been picked up by a number of uh, different fields, and one of them is laparoscopic surgery, where they uh, discovered totally independently that the young surgeons that were uh, action video game players were really good surgeons in the sense that they were performing surgery faster and not making more errors. And so there are a number, a number of medical schools in the US that are considering using video game as a training tool for laparoscopic surgery. Um, in our case, what we did is we followed up and tried to look at what are the neural basis of those differences. And there's a video here. I'm not sure whether it's going to play because I think I forgot to put it on this. Do you have it or you don't have it? No, okay. So that video is going to show you um, the different brain networks that are really important for, uh, oh, it's playing, great. So there is part of a network that we know that's important for orienting your attention and getting on task, another one which is important for keeping on task, and another one which is important for actually controlling all sources of distraction. This whole network is changed in people that play action video games. It's changed in the sense that it becomes more automatic. It's easier for them to stay focused and to stay on task. So um, what I've shown you is that playing this action video game leads to better attentional control, that um, these uh, people, as a result, are better at selecting what's task relevant from what is not task relevant. And um, what we're doing right now is showing that this actually gives an edge to these individuals in terms of learning. In a sense, because they know what is task relevant faster than people that don't play those games, they actually are better learners. That is, they can actually suppress sources of distraction, suppress sources of the noise, and show learning. I'm not going to show you those studies because I don't have a lot of time, but I actually want to go to um, the fact that we're doing that in different domain. So we're doing that in perception, we're doing that in visual motor learning, we're also doing that in much more cognitive domains, so language learning, or uh, working memory learning, or even uh, decision-making learning, and looking at which aspects of learning actually changed in those individuals for the better. Now, I want to end up with um, one last point, because I know there is a lot of confusion about um, technology and its impact on the brain and on our children. And in a sense, you could ask why so much confusion, and I already gave you a little bit of an answer. What I've told you is that action video games, for example, enhance attentional control, and in the studies that we do, we use as controls video games also. So you can't talk about the impact of video games on the brain. You cannot. Different video games will have different impact. And that is a first source of confusion in terms of unraveling exactly which video games change uh, which parts of your behavioral function. In our case, we've been showing that this action-packed first-person or third-person shooter game that you would think are totally inane actually have a fundamental impact on something very basic and very fundamental to learning, which is attentional control. Now, it's even more complicated because the, ecos the ecosystem of technology is very large. So lately, for example, we have been sold as a society the uh, fact that it's great to do media multitasking and to chat on Facebook at the same time as you send Instagram at the same time as you actually answer your phone. And a lot of kids do that. Um, and they think they are fantastic at multitasking. 
But there are a number of studies, the first one was actually carried in Stanford, that show that when you take undergraduates that report being the kings and queens of multitasking on different media, and you measure their multitasking abilities in the lab, they are slow and they make a lot of errors. And so it's very counterintuitive. Um, and some of these effects of technology are very counterintuitive. That's actually why it's so important to step into the lab and ask exactly how it acts and to sort of refrain from making like, you know, judgment of good sense because it's very, very difficult to know what is really going to be the outcome. Worse than that, the different use of technology interact. So I can tell you that we have been doing recent studies. It's not published yet. But if you play a lot of um, action video game and are also a very high mu mu multimedia users, you will look like a multimedia user. You, will don't, you won't have good attention control. You will have problem multitasking. And so we don't know yet the source of those interactions. But what we are seeing in the everyday world and what educators are seeing is certainly a result of those interactions because the children that you're dealing with are using all these different media all the time in many different complex ways. And so we need much more research to first understand at the society level, how the new technologies are actually affecting our brains. And then, um, really what we're doing in the lab is, for those technologies that seem to have a positive impact, how can we actually leverage them for education or for rehabilitation of patients? Thank you very much. Thanks.